Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com runs down the major markets. He tells us unpopular stocks are coming back, including the financials. He also comments on silver. Author of several books, including The Creature from Jekyll Island, G. Edward Griffin, gives us the lowdown on the creation of the U.S. Fed, who's behind it, and who benefits from it. He explains why it would be tough for governments to forgive all debts as governments, corporations, and individuals are drowning in red ink. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from American Manganese President Larry Ray. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can also find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Always nice to be with you, Jim. Ross, was this kind of a comeback week for things that weren't all that popular for the last few months? Yeah, and you take a look at it. I mean, we've been in this mode where anything that was internet or uh, healthcare oriented uh, was just on a roll. And uh, the ones that have been held back, uh, particularly over on the financial side, I'm starting to see some life finally in them, um, not just in the U.S. side, uh, but also in the Canadian. Um, some of the major Canadian banks, like Royal Bank, um, had a nice little pop uh, middle of the week on earnings. A little came back a little bit on Friday, but uh, starting to look like decent bases in here. We, you know, from that big oversold condition, then the consolidation. So, um, it wouldn't be at all surprised that uh, we see a bit more of that. The, the leaders like Apple and Shopify, uh, we've got uh, uh, some divergences up here. The money flows have started to slow a little bit. Uh, we look at things like the demand index or the Chaken money flow, and they peaked on the, uh, the rally about 10 days ago uh, when we had uh, a small pullback. And uh, then we had a small pullback, and um, the secondary rally of the uh, this last week really doesn't have the force behind it. So clearly, the the valuations, the people that are looking at their uh, models, uh, are are looking for something else to be involved with. The uh, of a note, um, the European markets, the Fez. Uh, which is the ETF for the uh, uh, SOX 50 in uh, in Europe. That had a really nice uh, breakout this week. Uh, it was a good consolidation uh, at, uh, after its first run up from the low, and uh, it started to come to life. Yeah, there's uh, you know talk about you know maybe you know changes over there as far as uh, the currency is concerned. So. Um, the say pretty decent life. The, the ETF went uh, from 29 up to 33 and a half. So percentage wise, it was actually one of the uh, the better runs on the week. Now gold has uh, been in the bullseye for quite some time. Has silver finally started reaching some targets? Yeah, the uh, you know the the gold silver ratio hit just that absolute extreme at, at 120 or 130 here about a month and a half ago. Um, so silver was just, you know, the cheapest we had seen relative to gold in years. So, uh, we got, uh, we've had two good rallies off the bottom and, uh, followed by a consolidation. And then this week it's come back to life again. Um, the, now, um, uh, whereas the gold market peaked about six weeks ago around the 1730, 1735 range, and it uh, ended up this week around 17:30. So it's it's just biding time. But silver's been managing to slowly stair step up. Um, I was thinking we could have a deeper correction in both of them, 
the uh, the gold model that I've been working with right now uh, would allow for a correction back to the uh, the twenty week or fifty week moving averages, which are more in the the, the mid sixteen hundreds, maybe the low sixteen hundreds. Um, we could get down to there, still be in a, a major rising trend, and I think that if the uh, consolidation were to get there, I'd be very very aggressive with the long side of the miners. The uh, the silver though. The um, been looking at uh, the relationship between the uh, Commodity Research Bureau index of uh, prices and the price of silver, and we know that typically silver is is a is a decent inflation hedge. Actually, it's a better inflation hedge than the gold is. When when there's a real run in commodity prices, uh, silver will outpace gold, and there have been, in the last 40 years or so, we've had uh, maybe 10 to 12 times that uh, the CRB index has been hit really, really hard, most recent one being into the middle of April. And coming out of those lows, silver has been one of the, the strongest performers and most persistent ones on the upside. So... Um, with uh, the bounce that we're seeing in commodities, and you can see that in the oil market, you know we're now into the low 30s as far as oil is concerned. We've got stability over in um, the agricultural commodities, which had just been decimated uh, this year. But there's stability showing there. So if the uh, if the commodity indexes start to push much higher here, then there's no question in my mind that that's really going to be a, an underlying support for silver. For more than just a few weeks, probably for an extended period of time. So, um, the, uh, the silver is something that uh, people should be looking at, and uh, it'll be a, a buy the dip scenario probably for the next couple of months. Ross, thank you so much for your report. As I say, uh, we enjoy our time with you, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. You can also find him on Twitter at charts by Ross. Coming up, G. Edward Griffin, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is G. Edward Griffin, author of a number of books, including The Creature from Jekyll Island. He's online at redpilluniversity.org. And it's been a while, but welcome back to This Week in Money. Well, yes, it has been a while. Thanks for inviting me back. Uh, first of all, can you tell us about Red Pill University? Oh, yes, I can tell you about that because I've been working around the clock on that now for a couple of months. I guess you know that things are pretty desperate. Everybody knows things are going really weird, and I think they're going to get weirder and weirder, as they say. So we're trying to figure out what is the best way to fight back and get the truth out and organize some kind of some resistance to this madness. So I've centered most of my plans on Red Pill University as the instrument. So uh, let me tell you about it. Red Pill University is uh, part of what we call uh, our Red Pill Project. Pro the project has two components. The university is one, and the Red Pill Expo is the other. And they're both similar in that they have the, they share the meme of uh, the Red Pill. You know, take the Red Pill and wake up to reality, and don't take that Blue Pill because that will put you back into La La Land and mythology and illusion. And all of that comes from that sci-fi movie, as you probably well know. It's called The Matrix. It came out about 20 years ago. Very popular movie. Well, anyway, we thought that the uh, the theme was pretty good because, uh, you know, it, it turned out that the, all of this was a science fiction movie 20 years ago. Wow, we're living in it today, and it's real today, in the sense that so many of the important things in our life, the really important things, you know, our... our uh, 
our well-being, our health care, our money system, our liberties, our freedoms, everything, uh, the environment, all of those things we're living in, in myths, things that aren't what we are told they are. I, it's hard for me to believe that at first because I was kind of a trusting guy. You know, I was raised like most of us, brought up in the, in the system, and I believe that if the teachers say it, it's true, and if the parents say it, well, it's got to be true, you better believe it. <laughs> and, and of course, if, if everything you see on television and in the movies, and they're saying it too, well, who is to question it? Well, then as you get a little bit older, you start to question that, all of these things. So anyway, that's behind the Red Pill Project, and what we're trying to do is wake people up to the, to the reality in all of these fields. And boy, starting a few months ago, the, the myths that abound in the healthcare field came to the surface with this pandemic of coronavirus. And so that's been our focus, mainly because it's, it's so constantly in the news and it's on everybody's mind. And it should be because it's affecting everybody's, their lives so fundamentally. So Red Pill University is, is, consists of two things. It's a, it's an online university. It's not really a brick and mortar thing. Uh, you, you don't go there and sit in classes, but we have a lot of what we call classes, and they are presentations by some of the best minds, some of the best experts we can find anywhere in the world who are speaking out on these issues. And uh, let's take the coronavirus issue, for example. We've got some great programs there, presentations made by uh, doctors and researchers, some of them very high up in the pecking order. We have um, a Nobel Prize winner doctor. Uh, we have an MIT expert, top scientist at MIT. People who are, you know, they're not just little guys practicing medicine in some small town or researching in their basement. These guys are at the top of their craft. And they're telling us that this, this coronavirus pandemic is not anywhere close to what we're being told by the mainstream and by government officials. And it's just an eye-opener. And once you begin to see what they're talking about, everything falls into place. And, of course, another issue which is lurking in the background is the economy. While everybody's looking at, you know, being confined to their houses and not being able to go to work, and we know that tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of small companies are going out of business, all the ma and pa operations are really struggling. That means there are millions of people being put out of work. They're all going on welfare now. Nobody's questioning where that money's going to come from to pay them. And so now we're back to my favorite topic, or one of them, which is the Federal Reserve System and the banking system and, and the myths about money and the red pill there. So it just goes on and on. And uh, so many things to talk about. And all of them we brought together at Red Pill University. And why are we doing that? Well, because somebody's got to push back. And if, if you don't know what the truth is, if, if your only source of information is what you see on television uh, or see the politicians say when they stand up and tell you why they're taking away another one of your liberties. It's all for your own good, of course. If that's all you see, you just become passive and say, oh, my gosh, I wonder if I'm going to survive. But once you get the, the whiff that, oh, my gosh, this is not just, it's not what it appears to be. It's not what it appears to be at all. And, and there's some hidden agendas there which nobody likes to think about. But anyway, they're there, and um, then you you got to do something about it. So that's where my life is. I don't know. That didn't really tell you much, except I'm I'm really focused right now at Red Pill University because I think it's a it's a staging area where people can come together from all walks of life. In fact, in all countries, this thing is going on around the world, and they can discover that they're not alone. That there are a lot of well qualified people who are on to what's going on, and they don't have to necessarily take all their information from the official questionable sources. So I'm trying to put that together because if there's going to be a pushback, it's got to be based on large numbers of people knowing the truth. So there you have it. It's a little bit longer than I expected to take to explain what Red Pill was about. But it's all about truth, spreading the word, getting getting the truth out there, and then creating a coalition of people who know the truth and who want to do something about it. What is the creature from Jekyll Island? Well, The Creature from Jekyll Island is uh, is my book on the Federal Reserve System. And the reason I called it The Creature from Jekyll Island, well, two reasons, actually. First is it was kind of a, 
fascinating title, I thought. You know, if, if somebody would be walking down the street and they saw my book in a bookshop window, and they might think, hmm, I wonder if that's a sequel to uh, Jurassic Park or, or something like that, and walk in and buy it. Well, not really, I'm just kidding, but it's a tricky title. But, but the other reason is that it makes sense because the Federal Reserve was created on a place called Jekyll Island. It's a real island. It's off the coast of Georgia. And back in 1910, when all the action started in my book, it's when the Federal Reserve System was conceived by a small group of six very powerful bankers from the United States, representing all the major banks and a couple of the foreign banks as well, uh, especially from uh, from London, from England, Bank of England. And so the six people met there. They represented about one-fourth of the wealth of the whole world. They held a secret meeting there on Jekyll Island in a private clubhouse that's still standing, by the way. In fact, that whole island was a private club in those days, owned by these people, and it was called the Jekyll Island Club. It was a private island, and uh, very, very swank facilities. A lot of very wealthy industrialists and bankers had their winter cottages there where the families would escape the cold environs of New York for the winter. A beautiful place. You can visit it now and see some of those cottages, as they called them. Beautiful place. Anyway, that's where the Federal Reserve was created at a highly secret meeting back in 1910. And I got whiff of that, oh gosh, it was quite a while ago, 20 years ago now, more. And I thought, you know, why is the secrecy? I didn't know much about the Fed, but I, I knew enough that when people do things in secret, there's usually something to hide. And so I was curious as to what it was they were trying to hide. Well, it didn't take long, I found out. I found out why they held the meeting away from New- from um, Washington, D.C., why the Federal Reserve Act was conceived there. They didn't want anybody to know who was creating the act. The act was pla- passed into law, supposedly, the American people were told, it was supposedly to control those big bad bankers who were running amok on Wall Street and causing havoc in the in the markets and in the economy, runs on the bank, inflation, loss of money. Somebody's got to control those big banks, right? And so the bill came up, and who wrote the bill? The big banks. That's what the secrecy was all about. They decided that, well, if there's going to be a bill to control our industry, we're the ones that are going to write it, brother. And so they did. They wrote it just exactly the way they wanted it, made it appear as though it was some kind of external control over their own industry. But actually, it was a cartel agreement, which gave them a great deal of power. In fact, it was funny as I got deeper into the research, I found out that they got more power out of this ploy than they really expected. They just thought they would get some special privileges from Washington to cover their losses when they went bankrupt, forced the taxpayers to bail them out. But instead, uh, Woodrow Wilson and, and some of the other uh, people in the Senate got the idea that, well, let's just give the whole thing over to the, these private banks and let them make the nation's money supply. And they really didn't expect that. But they said, this can't be true. But nevertheless, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wilson. And so out of that came not only special privileges for the banks, which protected them from bankruptcy, making sure that they could get their hands in the pockets of the taxpayers to bail them out, which we've seen happening over and over again, and which is going on right now, as a matter of fact. But not only that, they got the the power to create America's money. If you look at the bills today, it used to say, you know, United States Treasury note. Now it says Federal Reserve note. And so there, the whole story appears on that one line on the on the dollar bill when it says Federal Reserve note. Instead of uh, United States note, the, the whole story is contained right there, that these banks formed a cartel. They called it the Federal Reserve. They sold it to the American people. We think, most people think it's a government agency, but it's not. It's a private banking cartel. They make the nation's money supply. They can make it out of nothing, which they're doing right now. They, they bought up all the politicians. And even though we get the idea that the government controls the banks, the truth is, the banks now control the government. And there, in a nutshell, is the whole story. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, they call it the U.S. Fed, the Bank of Canada, the Bank of England. That gives the impression it's a government organization. Are those organizations really government? Not at all. Not at all. They're private banks. They're a cartel. And uh, and they own, the, they own the governments because, look, the politicians passed the laws. There was 
It was Lord Rothschild, way, way back, over 100 years ago. He, uh, nobody could find him actually writing this, but everybody agreed that he said it. If he didn't say it, he often meant it. And that was this. He's quoted as saying, I care not who makes the laws, but give me the power to make the money. <laughs> and, of course, it's true. If you can make the money, you can buy the politicians who make the laws. Bingo. It's done. That's what we're living under today. Now, you've given us some background about who created uh, this creature. Who's behind the creature right now? Well, it's the same banks. It's the, it's the major banks. It's a cartel. You know, it's like the, who's behind the oil cartel? Well, it's the members of the, of the oil cartel. Um, so we got, you know, big banks, Bank of America, Chase Manhattan, a bank, you know, uh, the Morgan banks, all the, all the big banks. There are a lot of them. Of course, all the small banks are in there too, but they don't carry a lot of weight. It's the big banks, like in any cartel, that wag, you know, the tail that wags the dog. So it's the banks. It's uh, We're living under a system of the banks, for the banks, and by the banks. We've heard rumblings. U.S. Treasury has absorbed or is going to absorb the Federal Reserve. What are you hearing? And would it make any difference? Well, I've heard those rumors. They're yeah. very strong. And I, I have to laugh. <laughs> Who could possibly believe that? It's because, oh, is it really happening? And it, it sounds like it might be a good thing because everybody is kind of suspicious of those big bad bankers, you know. But no, I have, I don't, I don't see any evidence of it. I mean, if they really wanted to take it over, they would simply pass a law. They would, they would either rewrite the charter of the, uh, of the Federal Reserve, which they haven't done, to my knowledge. It certainly hasn't been in the paper. I've looked for it. I don't see any evidence, any evidence that they've reworked the charter. They certainly haven't, uh, they haven't abolished the Federal Reserve. They haven't officially turned anything over to the Treasury. I just think it's part of the usual propaganda that you get. They pass out little things, you know, did you hear this or did you hear that? Is this really happening? It's kind of like a QAnon thing. Oh, golly, there's some good guys in the government. We don't have to do anything. Just sit back and wait. It's all going to turn out okay. Uh, you know, we live on rumors, or I should say a lot of people live on rumors, and they, they believe anything that's hopeful. And uh, so I think it's in that category. Uh, but in truth, I don't know. If there's something afoot, I should just say I'm not aware of it. What would the U.S. Treasury have to do to absorb the Federal Reserve? Well, the U.S. Treasury has no power over the Federal Reserve whatsoever. Uh, what would happen is the Congress would have to uh, either rewrite the Federal Reserve Charter completely uh, or just... Uh, abolish it and replace it with a new one. That's the same thing. It would ha Congress would have to do it. There'd be a whole lot of debate on it, I presume, and a lot of opposition, a lot of jockeying for position on who gets the better deal out of it, who gets to steal the most money out of the new system. Those things go on. I haven't seen any of that. So the, the Treasury is, has no power whatsoever over the Fed. The Fed issues orders to the Treasury. The Treasury gets orders from the Fed all the time of how much money to print. The Treasury runs the printing presses, but it's the Federal Reserve that tells the Treasury how much money to print. So the power is, as I say, it's with the Fed. It's always been with the Fed, and I see no reason to really believe it's any different today. Should the U.S. Treasury absorb the Fed? Well, that's a good question. Should it? Uh, I don't think it makes much difference. I mean, the idea behind that is that, yeah, we hate those big bad bankers. If we could just turn that power to create money out of nothing... Uh, over to this nice, friendly, and reliable, honest, uh, trustworthy politicians, everything would be fine. you got to be kidding. They're all in the same boat. In fact, you'd see the, the same people moving back and forth. A lot of people, let's say the Treasury Department, for example, for a long, long time, the head of the Treasury has always been a big banker, always come for the banking industry. And when he's through being the Secretary of the Treasury, he goes back, becomes president of a bank. I mean, the banks run everything. And so now you say, shoot, would it be a good idea to turn the Federal Reserve over to the Treasury? Well, it, who runs the Treasury? It's the banks. I'm trying to get that point across. It makes no difference. And anyway, even if it did, the, the real problem, as I see it, is not who creates money out of nothing. It's the fact that creating money out of nothing has been legalized. I don't care who does it. Whoever does it is going to ruin the, the country. If you give anybody the power to create money out of nothing, out of debt, you know what they're going to do? They're going to create money out of nothing. 
and then more of it and more of it like they're doing right now. You see, it's a, right now we see these billions and trillions of dollars being created in a flash by everybody just raising their hands and voting for it. Where does that money come from? Nobody asks. Nobody asks. Well, it's just created out of debt. What's happening is that the Congress authorizes it. Has, they have to go through that little uh, play acting. They authorize it. That's a good idea. We need... We need a hundred trillion dollars at some magnificent figure in order to bail out everybody. We gotta send those twelve hundred dollar checks to everybody that we've caused them to lose their jobs by quarantining them. And they're gonna get mad unless we pay them some money. So let's give them some money. We'll give them all twelve hundred dollars to start with and then maybe next month we'll send another twelve and maybe the next month another twelve. The first thing you know, they're gonna be used to that money and they're gonna not want to go back to work. They're going to be very dependent on the government, and we've got to keep them happy, otherwise they'll revolt. So we just have to be able to create more and more and more and more, more and more money forever, and that's, they just create it. And the process goes like this. The Fed creates the money, so it exists on the books, but it's not money in circulation. It, it's just potential money. It's just authorized money. It goes into circulation and becomes real money when a loan is made. And so what happens is the Fed then loans or yeah loans the money to the federal government there's probably a bond exchange which they never talk about the federal i mean the government issues a bond let's say for a trillion dollar bond gives it to the fed fed tucks it in the drawer says okay we have an asset now this asset backs the money and so they release that money that was uh, authorized and give it to the um, uh, federal government now they have an unlimited amount of money to pay all those uh, nice people, they're twelve hundred dollar checks every month, and the first thing you know, everybody's dependent on the government. They're nice little slaves, and they don't question where the money came from. But they know that they can't buy anything with the money in their pocket because a loaf of bread costs fifty dollars, or hundred dollars, and so forth. They don't never realize. Well, that's how they got the money to give me that twelve hundred dollar check is by flooding it into the economy, and so the prices of everything went up. So they wind up paying it for themselves anyway. It's a trick. In other words. They don't teach this stuff in school. I didn't know any of it. And when I finally learned it, I thought, oh, my gosh, this is the world's greatest scam. If the U.S. Treasury absorbed the Fed, could the U.S. federal debt be eliminated with the stroke of a pen? Well, it could be eliminated. It's going to be eliminated anyway. It's being eliminated now through inflation. By that, I mean as prices go up, up, and up. Uh, how do I how do I explain this quickly? Um the old idea that I learned years ago was that it's a good idea to go into debt because de- inflation is going on out there. So you borrow uh, a dime, or you you borrow a dollar, let's say. So when at the time you borrow it, it buys a dollar's worth of goods. Let's say you can buy a loaf of bread for a dollar. All right, just an example. But you pay it back much, much later. Say so you pay it back 20 years later, and now that dollar is only worth a dime. So it only costs you a dime to use that, and, and plus a little interest, of course. But it, you make money by being in debt under a situation of inflation. And so that's why a lot of people like inflation, because they can use debt as a means of getting viable goods now at a certain rate. But by the time they have to pay back the debt plus the interest, what they're paying it back with is worthless. And so finally it gets to the point where this worthless stuff is really worthless. It doesn't buy anything. Now, even though there's this huge amount of debt, it just... It's gone because you can pay it back, but it doesn't buy anything. And during the Weimar Republic in Germany, uh, why they went through this cycle, and you can see pictures of people with wheelbarrows full of money going to the grocery store to buy stuff. And I saw some statistics on it at one time. Said one people that had saved their whole life savings. Let's let's say a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars. They saved this is their their little nest egg, and they bought an insurance policy, and now they were going to get their money back as an annuity, and the whole insurance policy that was cashed in would buy a postage stamp. So that's what happened to all of their savings. It was stolen from them. So that's how you pay off the debt. You pay it off with little pieces of paper that aren't worth anything. You don't even have to write it off. You just inflate it off. It's the game that the politicians are paying, paying now. They know that the debt will be paid off with, with worthless pieces of paper, not anything of value. And so, but the people, the taxpayers, have no idea what's being done to them. So they just think that life goes on and golly, i got a pay raise. Isn't that nice? It's too bad that the cost of everything went up greater than the pay raise. But anyway, what can I say? Uh, 
Can you write off the debt? You can. But if you did, then all of the things I'm talking about would happen immediately. And the debt, of course, is in, in would wipe out, if you wiped out the debt, you would wipe out most of the retirement funds, which are heavily invested in government bonds. If you say right off the debt, that sounds good. But if you did that, that means everybody's retirement fund that has government bonds in it would plunge to zero value. How does that sound? That's why they're never going to do it. We'll have more with G. Edward Griffin when This Week in Money returns. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with G. Edward Griffin. If the Fed was absorbed by the U.S. Treasury, what would happen to other central banks around the world? Nothing. Because if the Fed were absorbed by the Treasury, as I said before, I don't think anything would change. It'd just be cosmetic. It really makes no difference. The operation, the, the banks would still continue to create money out of nothing, and the government would borrow it from them. It might look a little different on the surface, but the operation would be the same. You see, it is it's a little bit different in other countries. Uh, uh, in, in in America, the Fed is a more more of a distinct organization. It looks it looks more distinct. I mean, we have all these regional banks and so forth. And in some countries, it's not quite so obvious. It looks more like it's a government agency. And in fact, if you were to make, if you were to turn the power of the Fed to create money out of nothing, if you were to turn that over to the Treasury or any government agency, they would continue doing exactly the same as the Fed. The only difference would be, and this is a, a significant difference, is that they wouldn't have to pay interest to the uh, to the banks to get to borrow the money, but that's not as bad as you might think because right now uh, the Fed collects uh, or charges, I should say, a huge amount of interest on all this money being created for the government because the government is going to pay interest on it, right? Well, uh, that's half right because the charter uh, uh, had when it was originally drafted uh, decreed that after. All the money that the Fed receives from the federal government in the form of interest on loans to the federal government, that money could be used to pay the expenses of the Fed. And after that, the rest of it would be returned to the government. So you see, it's not not as bad as it sounds. Uh, Most of that interest money is not ever going to be paid to the Fed because it would be excess over the expenses of the Fed. But that's still not a bad deal. The Fed, which don't forget is a private uh, cartel, it's a private cartel, very big, very expensive, has all of its expenses paid by the taxpayers in the form of interest on those loans. But anyway, the, the amount of interest that exceeds the operation of the cost of the Fed is returned to the federal government. So that's pretty much, if you look at it with that perspective, that's pretty much the way it works in most of the other countries as well. So what do you see, you see again, whether it's theoretically in owned or operated by the government or owned and operated by the private banks makes very little, if any, difference. It's the power to create money out of nothing and push it into the economy and fed and, and to fund the governments with that kind of money. That's the, where the criminal activity occurs, and that would continue no matter where the control is. We'll have more with G. Edward Griffin when we return with more on This Week in Money. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with G. Edward Griffin. 
In the U.S., President Trump is spending a lot of money on the American people to get the economy back on its feet in Canada. Justin Trudeau doing the same thing, plus spending a lot of money on other countries and institutions like the World Health Organization. is spending a lot of money on other countries and institutions, a strategy to destroy the levels of freedom and prosperity that Canadians currently enjoy. That's a very good question, and of course the active words is, uh, is it designed to do that? The simpler answer is that it does do that. I don't think anybody could argue much about that. The, the way the question is usually phrased is that, uh, the politicians are spending all of this money to restore the economy or to help the economy. And when you think about that, it's one of the most absurd assumptions you can make. You cannot create money out of nothing and then just give it to people to make up for their loss of income because now they're not producing anything. So production is stopped. You cannot just give them funny money and expect that's going to help the economy. It's going to keep them content for a little while and maybe postpone an impulse for revolution, but it's not going to do a thing for the economy except to damage it further. So when you peel back the vocabulary, these nice words that they use like Mr. Trump is spending this money to restore the economy. That sounds good, but and maybe that's his intent. But he's spending this money to destroy the economy. Now you have a different perspective on the whole thing. Are freedoms generally under attack? Uh, well, I guess uh, generally meaning in terms of time span or across the board in this moment of time or... Uh, I would say, yeah, I'll answer both questions to the best of my ability. I think freedoms are always under attack and will always be under attack throughout time by those who, who want our stuff. There are, I've discovered, I've lived a long time. I'm, I'm pushing 89 years old now. I've seen a lot of things happen and I've, my attitudes today are much different than they were when I was in college. I'm very idealistic and didn't understand much about the way things really work. But I've observed that there, in my view, there's probably about, oh, I think there's about 3% of the population that I would consider to be the predator class. These are people who want your stuff. They want it. And they, they would steal it if they could outright. They, they could probably go into a organized criminal syndicate of some kind. But they would rather go into government because now, They can steal your stuff, and they don't risk going to jail because they're now the people who determine who goes to jail. And yet they still steal your stuff. But in order to do that, they have to make it sound like it's for your own good. (laughs) So everything that, you know, everything that uh, costs so much in the way of taxes is always explained to us as, oh, yes, it's very expensive, but we've got to protect ourselves against those terrorists or that virus, or we've got to protect ourselves against pornography or or uh, drug addiction or oh you go on they have us scared all the time every time you turn around they're scaring us about something so we will be more passive when we get the price tag as what they're supposedly doing to protect us from those things and this is all because of that three percent the predator class then there's another probably uh i'm going to guess twelve percent uh that will go along with it. There'll be the people that will say, yeah, that, I'd like to work for you. It looks like it's a pretty cushy job and, uh, you never have to worry about going out of, being unemployed. Always work for the government. They always get their money somehow. So, and they'll go along and they'll look the other way. And, uh, then the rest of us, the other 85%, we get plundered. And we don't want to go into politics. Oh, we hate politics. We hate politicians. Those guys are, ah, nasty. And so we just sit back. We don't go to meetings. We don't join organizations. We don't run for office. We just, when it comes election time, we say, well, who did they select for me to choose from? You know, the average person has no voice in selecting the candidates. Uh, they look at the debates and they don't question, well, how, how did those people get on the platform? Who selected those people who are going to be candidates? And what deals did they have to make? So we sit back and let the world go by thinking that it's all, you know, we're, everybody up there on the stage and all the politicians in the background, they're all Boy Scouts. They're all, you know, doing their honor to God and to their country, and they're totally honest and all that stuff. Well, you can believe that when you're young, but when you get older, you realize that, uh-oh, this is one of those uh, those red pills you have to take. 
human nature is that there are always the predator class out there. So the question is, are, are our freedoms under attack? You bet they are. Always have been and always will be. And now, if the question is, are they under attack today? Well, man, yeah, that it's, it's really in, in hyperdrive right now because some of the mechanisms they've designed for it are right in our face. And it's looking more and more like it's increasingly impossible to escape being uh, essentially being subject to martial law in the name of a, of a virus that is not as even as dangerous as the seasonal flu. So, yeah, our, the answer is yes and yes. Are a number of countries in the world experiencing totalitarianism? I'm going to guess that all countries in the world today are experiencing totalitarianism to one degree or another. Um, by totalitarianism, I guess we better define that somewhat. It simply means to me, at, at least in this sense of our discussion, totalitarianism is, it means a government which has total power, has total power, and the people have to do what they're told. I don't know of a better de definition than totalitarianism than a government with total power. So under the guise or the excuse of a pandemic, uh, most citizens are passive. They'll grant their government that total power. They think that totalitarianism is necessary for their own good, and that's the trick. Is central banking used to enslave people? Central banking is the mechanism by which the totalitarians have the money to do all of these things they must do to succeed. If we did not have central banking, which means if we did not have, if we did not have banks that legally could create money out of nothing, out of debt, and force us to use that money, let's add that to it. We always have those legal tender laws attached to it. I care not what the banks want to issue in the form of money, as long as I can choose to accept it and use it or not. But that's not how the game is played. They create a money, and uh, they go into partnerships with the politicians, and they pass legal tender laws, which may make it illegal for you and me not to use their money. So we have no choice. So uh, under those conditions, they can create as much of it as they wish, and they can pay for anything they wish without having to worry about it because they just figuratively turn on the printing press and the purchasing power of everything we buy goes down every time a new paper bill or digital bill comes out the other end of the machine. And so totalitarian systems cannot really exist without central banks because otherwise they couldn't fund themselves. Otherwise, they would have to go to the taxpayers and actually raise money through taxes. And history shows that once once a, a ruler taxes his people beyond about the 30% seems to be where it levels out, why well, they have a tax rebellion, they have a, a revolution on their hands, and all of a sudden the emperor, the great leader, is out of a job and probably off, missing a head. So as long as you have to raise money through taxes, there is a limit on the total power and ability of the government to control the lives of its citizens. So if you're going to have a true totalitarian system in the modern world, you must have a central bank. We'll have more with G. Edward Griffin when This Week in Money returns. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. We're chatting with G. Edward Griffin. Are we witnessing the need to control populations when economies are imploded? I'm taking a moment on that. I'm trying to think of what excuse people could people could offer for making a difference whether populations are imploded or exploded or rising or crashing or what. I don't really see uh, any connection there, although I'm sure somebody could make an argument. Um, I just I don't see any reason 
for expanding the money supply and creating money out of debt and forcing people to use it, whether the population is expanding or contracting. It just seems to me that that's, those two things really aren't connected. So if I understand your, your question correctly, I would say my answer is no. Are people becoming wise to the propaganda they're being fed? I think people are always becoming wise to the propaganda they're being fed. And, but the question is, for every person becoming wise to the propaganda, there are probably a couple of people uh, just falling for the propaganda coming up through uh, the younger generation. You know, you, you, it's sort of a process going on there. You, you come into the world and you don't know anything, and you learn what you're, and you believe everything you're told, and a lot of that is propaganda. You don't know. It sounds like that's the way it is. And then as you get older, you say, oh, my gosh, that's propaganda. And then you get a little older and you die. And uh, meanwhile, there's some new ones coming up along the bottom, and they believe in everything. So it's a cycle. And so, yeah, people are waking up to the propaganda that tends to be the older generation. And, of course, they're dropping off the other end while the new ones are coming up. So it's kind of a kind of a, uh, a, a game of numbers to see which, uh, uh, which group is growing the fastest. Now, what's my impression of which group is growing the fastest? My impression is that the all groups are waking up to propaganda at a rate faster now than they used to, mainly because the the propaganda is obvious or more obvious than it ever has been before for those who have the eyes to see. I mean, just take the coronavirus thing, for example. Oh, on television, all we see all day long, every day, is uh, the coronavirus crisis, the latest statistics pictures of hospitals that are overburdened and the numbers, the new numbers, the new death rate and what we're going to do and social distancing and how we're going to fight this thing and it's just constant, constant it's amazing, it's like a it, it's like a dystopian uh, movie about this dystopian future of living in some kind of a, a future where your brain isn't your own you, like 1984 on steroids everywhere you go, your TV is telling you all of these things that, that you're only allowed to think this one thing and that's what you're told constantly it's, it's almost like a like a movie but anyway um, I got a little sidetracked on that I, I think that people are seeing however that with this corona thing we're being told that the death rate is this and we got to do that and we're going to have to lock down forever more and so but where where are the COVID deaths where are they does anybody know somebody who actually is among these millions and millions and the answer is very few very few, and even those who are supposedly dying of COVID-19, now we're discovering that, no, they didn't die from COVID-19. They were hit by a car, or they had they had some kind of uh, serious disease beforehand, or they were 95 years old in, a, in an old folks' home, and they were on, the, on their deathbed anyway. Things like that are coming out, and people are hearing it, and at the beginning, they say, hey, wait a minute, this is bunk. Where is this pandemic? It's not real. And now even some of the institutions are publishing their statistics. I saw just yesterday the CDC itself, which in my view is very unreliable for this kind of thing, but all of a sudden they released some statistics. It wasn't highly publicized, but if you look on the back page of the data, you'll see that even the CDC is saying that the death rate from from COVID-19 is, are you ready for this, lower than the flu. Now, people that look at that, they're going to hear it, maybe, if the media allows that to get out. They're going to say, wait a minute, but we were told, and in fact, they're, they're clamping down on us. They're forcing us not to go to work because it's great danger, and now we find out that actually it's less than the seasonal flu? Well, yes. So the question is, yes, people are waking up at numbers more and more than ever before because it's becoming so obvious, whereas before, nobody cared much about it. It didn't seem to affect their lives. They would accept the lies and the distortions without even questioning it. So the question is, which which group or which momentum is going to overpower the other one? I think that the people want to, who want to clamp down and make this into a, a forever totalitarian system, not just a temporary one for a, a pandemic, but a forever one, I think that they realize that the window for their opportunity is closing, that it won't be long before the tipping point will happen, and there'll be too much popular pushback. So they're pushing very fast and very hard now to make it happen. And then by the same token, the harder they push and the faster they go, the more obvious it becomes that this is a theater. So the the amount of awakening 
is going on faster and faster, and it's getting to be like the uh, close end of a horse race. It's going to be breathtaking to see who crosses the finish line first. Are there cancer cures that exist but are being hidden? Well, now you're on to one of my old topics, one of which I've had a lifelong interest in, and that is cancer research and therapy. Um, you probably know I wrote a book back in 1974 called World Without Cancer, the story of vitamin B17. And um, the theme of that book is that, yes, uh, cancer is not, really it's not something to be cured because it's not even a disease. Uh, cancer is a deficiency disease, if you want to call it that. It's like scurvy or pellagra. It's not caused by something. It's caused by the lack of something. And that there are several things that are involved. Actually, any, any breakdown in the, in the body's um, normal biological system can result in, in the abnormal growth of certain cells because they're not being nourished correctly. They don't have the right macro and micronutrients to make them function correctly. But there are several of them that are major uh, players in that role. And uh, one of them is a food factor. Probably the most important one is a food factor. And it's found in 1,400 edible plants. And it's all around the world. It's easy to come by. There's no reason not to eat these foods, which are excellent. Uh, there, There are micronutrients that the body requires for the prevention of cancer developing. But people don't like to eat those foods because they're bitter to the taste. If you've ever eaten an apple seed, you know what it tastes like. It's called amygdalin, and it's in a lot of seeds and a lot of grasses and things. But in modern societies, we we select against bitter foods because we like the sweeter flu- foods. And so the more advanced the society gets, the more affluent the people become, and the more processed their foods become, the rate of cancer goes up. So when you ask, is there a cure for cancer, it's not quite a cure for cancer, there's a way to avoid cancer, and yes, it's been known for decades and decades. And one of the most important elements of that that knowledge is knowing what to eat. It's as simple as that. Is the quality of tap water the elephant in the room that's being ignored? <laughs> well, oh, I love these questions. <laughs> well, I think there are a couple of elephants in the room, but I guess that's one of them, yeah. Um, it's not being ignored by a lot of us. I and mean, a lot of us are very, very outspoken about the quality of the water, and but we, we tend to get silenced, and, and we're, the public is told, well, don't listen to those people. They're just a bunch of conspiracy theorists, and they're nuts. They don't know what's going on. So, for yes, I, the answer is, in my view, definitely the quality of water is is uh, very poor compared to what it could be. Uh, we're dealing not only with the purification to get the pathogens out of it, which is a topic in itself because in addition to the traditional pathogens, uh, now we have water supplies that are, are very polluted with uh, pharmaceutical drugs that have gone through the bodies of the people who have taken them, and not all of them are, are metabolically processed in the body. A lot of them come out in the urine and the feces. They go in the water supply, and they survive into the drinking water. You're getting, you're getting uh, pharmaceutical drugs that you never would dream of taking, just by drinking a glass of water, they can't get all that stuff out in most cases. So you have that. And uh, also you have the, the addition to the water supplies of things like fluorides, which supposedly, supposedly are to <laughs> prevent dental caries among kids. And for that reason, I, or, they force everybody, old and young, uh, to take fluorides in their water supply, which, of course, these particular fluorides are extremely toxic. And uh, on and on and on. Yes, there are a lot of serious questions about that, what's in our water supply. And uh, it raises a lot of questions about whether people actually know what they're doing. Could it be that they're deliberately doing that? We don't. It's a horrible thought. We don't want to think that. So we just think that, well, they're stupid. They don't know. They need to be informed. And yet, I've watched this go on for years. You can inform people on a city council or in a water district. You can show them the hard data that this stuff is toxic, and they, they say, oh, yeah, thank you very much, and then all of a sudden um, they don't want to talk to you anymore, and they just go on, and, and there's a lot of suspicion that there's some payoffs going on to dump stuff in the water supply that uh, shouldn't be there. Well, now you're getting into conspiracy theories. I don't know, but the simple answer to all these questions is, yeah, the elephant is large, and it's ugly, 
and the water supply is not what we think it is. And I, years ago, I wanted to produce a documentary film, never did it, but someday I might. It's simply called Don't Drink the Water. Well, Vancouver's never had fluoride in the water, so I guess it's one thing we don't have to worry about. Congratulations. But just don't lower your guard, because next year, who knows? What percentage of people do you think can think for themselves? I think everybody, almost everybody, can think for themselves. But we've gotten out of the habit, because in the school system that's run by the government, we're taught not to think for ourselves. It's... uh, if, if you think for yourself and it run, runs contrary to what they say you're supposed to think, well, then you're punished. You're criticized. You're saying, well, now, you're not a team player, you know, and you, you, you're questioning authority. Don't question authority. So this is hammered into us. It was certainly hammered into me when I went through school. I wanted to be a team player, and I, I didn't want to think for myself. I, I wanted to depend on somebody else smarter than me, making all the tough decisions and making it easy for me. They just tell me what to do, and all i got to do is do it. <laughs> but So once we get out of that environment and we begin to question the results of following the official party line, we begin to start thinking for ourselves. And sometimes it's a pretty unpleasant and painful experience because we've got to question a lot of cherished beliefs that we've lived with for so long, and they were comfortable beliefs. It's uncomfortable, really uncomfortable to think that you cannot trust authorities. But once you understand that 3% of the population is a predator class, and almost all of those gravitate into positions of authority over others so they can be predators without fear of punishment, then you realize that the authority class and the predator class are quite often the same. So now you say, I've got to start questioning authority if you want to survive in health and in liberty. As we emerge from these government-mandated lockdowns, where are we likely to find the most freedom? I guess that depends on what happens in the next couple of years, or maybe even the next couple of months. If the plans that are underway are not stopped and reversed, I hate to say this, but it's my belief that if those plans are not stopped or reduced, there will be no place where you and I can find freedom. The elite will have freedom of some extent, as long as they don't get out of line and support each other. But the average person who's being told what to do, what to think, where to go, what to take into his body, what foods to eat, what injections to take, you know, uh, there will be no place for him because if they succeed in instituting this social score system that they are now unwrapping right now as we speak, which was based on the Chinese system, which has been a beta model for about a year and a half, I think. Once that is done, there would be no freedom because even if you balk, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to take that vaccine, or I'm not going to whatever it is they want you to do, and um, and they say, what are you going to do about it? Well, all they do is just flip a switch And all of a sudden, you can't travel, you can't get on a bus, you can't get on an airplane, you can't go into a grocery store and buy groceries, you can't buy gasoline at the pump, you can't buy clothes, you can't pay your rent. So what are you going to do? You do. You have to comply if you want to survive. And they won't have to put you in prison, at least not the kind with the gun towers. All they'll have to do is just quarantine you in your home, which you won't be able to pay for, by the way, so you'll be out on the street. That's the system I see coming into play right now, if we don't stop and reverse it quickly. Where can people buy your books and follow you online? Well, the best place, of course, is uh, at our uh, our bookstore, which is realityzone.com. realityzone.com. We've got all my my stuff, but plus a lot of other great material. We've got about 100 videos and books, audio uh, recordings, and that's all at realityzone.com. But for our movement and for our our coalition, our campaign, pushing back and to build some kind of resistance to this this uh, totalitarian system as we were talking about, come please to a website called redpilluniversity.org, redpilluniversity.org, and splash around there and see what we've got, a lot of information, but we're also building uh, a coalition, boots on the ground, people, people who get together 
Actually, can you imagine this? Get together and meet eyeball to eyeball, touch each other, talk to each other, and get organized to do things at the local level, which is what they don't want anybody to do. Part of the reason they want you locked down and at home so you cannot meet with others. Anyway, if you, if you come to the point in your, in your mind where you really want to do something about this, the place for you to start is redpilluniversity.org. Thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Well, thank you. I hope I haven't scared away your listeners, and I uh, just wish everybody health and happiness and freedom. My guest has been G. Edward Griffin, author of a number of books, including The Creature from Jekyll Island. He's online at redpilluniversity.org. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark and G. Edward Griffin. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update from American Manganese CEO and President Larry Ray. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Welcome back to the show, Larry. Well, thanks, Jim. Larry, anything new across your newly sanitized desk? Well, there's a lot of uh, stuff that's new that's came through my computer. Uh, we did have a press release this, uh, this week, uh, talking about extending some warrants, about 5.2 million warrants at, uh, 25 cents. And, uh, I just wanted to explain that, uh, you know, people take down private placements, uh, mostly because they get a warrant, which, uh, leverages their investment. And, uh, and if this market is in the ash can, uh, and the warrants are set to expire, we, uh, we want to be fair to those shareholders to put the money into the treasury to help advance the company and extend those warrants. And uh, it uh, doesn't cost anything to do that except for the fees that we pay to the exchange. And uh, it, uh, you know, could result in uh, actually uh, what I call free money uh, somewhere down the road where we get the warrants exercised like we did. Uh, we got close to 750,000 warrants exercised in December, up to December 31st. And uh, so I've been getting a few emails asking about that, but the reality is it's, uh, you know, it gives the, uh, the investor uh, an opportunity to uh, enrich in his, what his holdings, and it gives the company an opportunity to get some, uh, get some money down the road. So that's a good thing. And just uh, before I get into anything new that's crossed my desk that's excited me, I'd like to kind of update everybody on the uh, optimization of the pilot plant, which was uh, increasing densities and all of those things to try and get more throughput. And uh, we did do, we got a ways along on that, but we uh, hit a couple of hiccups on the increased, uh, in densi- in increased density and the increased amount of material that we were putting through, so we had to switch out some parts, but hopefully that is all done now, and we can continue on with the testing. So, uh, and that's the idea. I mean, that's the whole idea, is find any weaknesses uh, in a plant by running it, as Norm Chow says, until it chokes, and uh, and then you address the problems before you uh, just design, get in the final design of the uh, plant. So I'm happy with the progress that's being made there, and uh, some of the things that have come across our desk are, you know, Richard Branson and uh, Bill Gates uh, funding mining projects, and I think there was also a mention of recycling, and uh, which uh, tells me that they see that uh, critical metals are critical, 
and they should uh, people should be investing in them. So I think that's a great thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's another avenue for companies to go. We would hope that uh, maybe we will come to their attention. We're certainly trying to do that. And uh, but uh, you know those are all positive things for the market. Now. Uh, if they do decide to uh, go into recycling, uh, you know, that could be a big hit for us. But we are talking to several groups, uh, and people would be surprised at the, uh, at the companies that we do talk to. Uh, uh, everybody wants an NDA. you got to pay that up front, up front. Everybody wants an NDA. They don't want the, uh, the company to get running on uh, some news that hasn't happened yet. And uh, so... We do have NDAs with them, but they're, you know, they range from uh, commodity companies to motorcycle companies to uh, oil companies uh, to battery manufacturers. Uh, in that vein, we're still doing ongoing work with Tier 1 companies, and uh, so at some, at some point we uh, should be able to update on that. But it's... Uh, it's busy in here. We've never, uh, to be honest with you, uh, we've been what we thought was monumental busy uh, for the last uh, couple of years. But now with the coronavirus and everybody sitting at home and, they, and able to uh, catch up and uh, do investigations, uh, you know, through their computer, it's uh, it's doubled. And uh, so we're we're flat out in here. Um, we're, you know, not only talking to battery manufacturers, we're talking to governments. Uh, there's all kinds of st- stuff that could happen here. And, uh, you know, but the coronavirus bring- brings that attention to us, but it also uh, limits anybody that can come out and actually look at our process. And uh, so it's, uh, it's a, a good thing in one way, a bad thing in the other way. So... Uh, but we're uh, we're happy with uh, with our progress in here. We've made nothing but prog- positive progress uh, on the uh, on our our uh, lithium ion battery metallurgical recycling plant and uh, patents and all of those things that have happened are uh, uh, just big kudos for the company. Uh, you know, sure we get set back uh, maybe a week or two on. Uh, on parts and everything like that, especially ones that have to be fabricated. And uh, but the uh, the reality is, uh, as far as the uh, our process goes, it's solid. And uh, so you know, it is a uh, weekend coming up, and uh, you know, it's a nice day, partially cloudy here. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, wish everybody a a uh, great weekend, and hopefully you can get outside and get some fresh air. And uh, you know, that's exactly what I would hope to be doing. And, uh, you know, we'll continue, as I always do, I continue doing work on the weekend. Larry, how can people find out more about American Manganese, and where are you traded? American Manganese has a very user-friendly uh uh, website called AmericanManganeseInc.com. We've got everything on there that anybody that wants to do a thorough due diligence can go there. And uh, that's the place you should go if you're thinking about making an investment or if you're looking at uh, you know being involved in our technology. And uh, so that's a great site. That, uh, there's lots of disclosure on it. The... Uh, we can uh, we trade on the Tr- Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol AMY. We trade in the U.S. under the symbol AMYZF. We trade in uh, the uh, Frankfurt under the symbol 2AM. We can be reached at 778-574-4444. Or you can email me at L-R-E-A-U-G-H at AMYMN.com. Larry, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome. We've been speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on May 29th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. 
archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.